this place with the anointing in this place to touch some lives this morning. God is just asking God for one more touch. You know my name. You know my name. You know my name. Ha. Somebody needs to believe that in this place. He knows my name. He calls me by name. He says in his word, he knows every grain of hair on your head. He says in his word that before you were formed, he knew you. He says in his word that he has written your name in the palm of his hands. And he said, by no means, no one shall pluck thee out. He says in his word that we are the apple of his eyes. And no harm will come nigh us. He says in his word that he has made us and grafted us and knitted us in our mother's womb. He said in his word that he has called us to the nations. Father, you said that. Because you said that you know me more than I know myself. So I believe that you know my name. Ha. I believe that you know my name. Because you know my yesterday before I have arrived to yesterday. You know my ending before I have started the race. You definitely got my name. So Father, we rely on you. We trust in you this morning, God. That you've got it this morning. That you understand everything. That you have already been there, done that. We look to you this morning, God. The author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we pray that you would gird us up this morning, dear God. Those that are fainting. Those that are trembling. Those that are losing their step. Those that are losing their words. Those that are losing their faith. Those that are losing their tears. Those that are losing, oh God, Lord, so much stuff. Oh God, we pray, God, that you would keep us this morning, God. As you have given us assurance that you know our name. Father, we thank you for the move in this place that you're about to do. We thank you for every life that is under the obedience of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring every mind under the subjection of the Holy Ghost. And everything that is against your word, we pull it down. In the name of Jesus, every high thing, everything that exalts itself against the word and the knowledge of God, we bring it to naught in the name of Jesus. I will loose your Holy Ghost in this place uh, to have dominion, to have deliverance, to touch every life and to set every captive free. We speak, oh God, Lord, sight to them that are blind. I speak, oh Lord God, freedom to those that are still captive. I speak, oh Lord God, loose hands uh, to those that are bound. I speak, oh God, beauty for ashes to those that are burnt. I speak, oh Lord God, peace uh, to those that are feeling the storm. I speak, oh God, Lord, uh, in the midst of the fire, they won't be burned this morning, God. I speak to every raging storm. Peace be still. For this one thing we are confident. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. No height, no depth, nowhere. So, Father, we thank you in advance for everything we're about to receive, for the bread we're about to eat this morning, God. We eat this bread with rejoiceful hearts, thanking you, O oh Lord God, that you are able to supply our every need. Father, Lord God, I surrender as your servant, and I thank you, O oh God, for orchestrating your move. 
over my life and over this word as I release it into the atmosphere. I declare it will not return to you void. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I take the word this morning from 2 Kings chapter 6, reading from verse 12 to verse 19. A pleasant good morning to each and every one. I greet you in the most precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior. That name is Jesus Christ. And it says, and one of his servants said, none, my Lord, O king, but Elijah, the prophet that is in Israel, tell it the king of Israel, the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, go. And spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dutton. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you see. But he led them to Samaria. Father, we thank you for the reading of this word this morning. And we pray, God, as you will continue to have your way in this place, we thank you in advance for all you've already done in this place, in the lives of every person here, and all you're still about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. He knows my name, he knows my name. This morning, for a short time, I want to minister on, Lord, I want to see. This is my prayer this morning, and I hope at the end of this sermon, this will become your prayer. Lord, I want to see. Today, as we embark upon this journey of discovery, and I use the word discovery, it's because I'm going to take my time to teach you a little bit about how blind we really are. We will discover, firstly, that war is inevitable, but more so is your sight. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, and if the enemy wants to find you, he can still find you. It doesn't matter what category of ministry you possess, worshiper, leader, minister's wife, pastor. If the devil wants to find you, he can locate you. But what I've come to understand from reading and studying Elijah, it's not about the enemy finding you, but it's about the enemy finding you knowing what you know. I've come to realize the enemy will always find us as believers because we're still on earth. He will find us whether we are praying. He will find us whether we are fasting. He will find us whether we're being the good housewife. He will find us whether we, whether we are being good faithful. Whatever it is you're doing this morning, Satan will still find you. It reminds us today, believers, we will always find ourselves in difficult battles, but we must be prepared. It tells us this morning, believers, that war is inevitable, but preparation is a must. 
the devil will always find us to deliver. It could be pastor, priest, or prophet. He will find you. There is no hiding place for you while you're on earth. But one thing you can be guaranteed is that if you are prepared for the enemy, he will be surrounded. So this morning as I take you on this journey, first thing I want to do is give you a little history on who Elisha was because we're going to be talking a lot about him today. Good morning, Pastor D. That was to make him blush. It worked. Amen. Elijah's who name means God is salvation was the successor of Elijah that most of us know and he held the office of a prophet in Israel he was called to follow Elisha as a little boy a young boy and he spent the next several years as the prophet's prodigy under Elijah until Elijah was taken into heaven at that time, Elijah began his ministry. Elisha began his ministry, which lasted about 60 years, spanning the reigns of kings Jeroboam, Jehu, Jehoahaz, and Johash. He lived through those kings, directing them and giving them instructions as God would have him to. He's at that chapter in 2 Kings chapter 6 today, where he's still giving Israel's direction. He's still informing the kings as his duty always was to tell them about the enemy. He would go to the king and he would warn them before the enemy appears. And that's why we begin the scripture hearing that the king was asking how do they know what is being said in his bedchamber? Because this young man, this protege of Elijah, Elisha, he was the one who was interceding for Israel. And he would hear for Israel and then he would go on the king and he would tell the king, don't go to battle, don't go to war, don't go to the valley, they are already there. He would save Israel numerous times. And that king, Ben Hazard, he decided he would find the man that was exposing his bedchamber secrets. So what you see here that I've read for you is that he has put together a chariot. He has put together an army or a band or a squad. And he decided he's going to Dutton for the man of God. He has decided he's going to take Elisha out. And if he could remove Elisha, he's going to remove the problem. But what he did not know is that Elisha was prepared. What ben Hada did not know is that Elisha was prepared. Today, preparedness is everything. We cannot escape the sorrows of life, nor can we escape the troubles of life, but we can be prepared for them. We cannot escape financial deficits, and problems and uh, uh, economy downturns, but we could be prepared for them. The church cannot get away from sickness, but we can be prepared for sickness by having the word of God hidden in our hearts when it comes. As long as we are on the earth, there are some carnal things that we cannot escape, but we can be prepared for to escape. Elisha is seen here faced with a situation no different from any believer. One where the enemy is mad and comes with everything. Only to find out God also came with everything. As far as the war raged, Elijah kept his composure in the midst of knowing. There is a difference when you know and when you don't know. I didn't start to preach yet, right? I'm laying some foundations. I'm still bending wires. Sorry, steel. I'm 
I'm not a builder, Brother Ramsey. Amen. Only for the kingdom. Right. It doesn't matter what flares up, what shows up after 10 years. You know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter what they say you're not worth. It doesn't matter what lies they have spread about your name. It doesn't matter who or what don't like you as long as you know. You see, I've come to realize, believers, you can't make everybody like you. Out of a hundred people sitting in this place today, maybe just 80 would like me. The next 20 would just be going with the flow because they have no other choice this morning. The reality is it doesn't bother me because I know who knows my name. It doesn't move me because I know who still got my back. It doesn't bother me because God will still provide. It doesn't bother me because if I go in prison, I will sing to him and he will still cause an earthquake to run through the prison and free me. You see, it's not about what people said about me. It's what I know about God. And if I know what God said, that's all that matters. Stop trying to get everybody to like you in this room. Stop trying to get everybody to love you in this room. It's not going to work out in your favor. You're not a superstar. You're not famous. You don't got the best voice. You're not perfect. And they still won't like you. Don't you see what's happening to Messi? He's looking real messy. While he was looking perfect a year ago, Right now, people are throwing him under the bus. That's who people are. They love you one moment, and then they hate you the next. And that's not true patriots. That's why God doesn't like that spirit and calls the church to separate themselves from that. You can't love somebody today and hate them tomorrow. It's either you're for them or you're not for them. So you people who watch World Cup, be careful. You may be displaying a spirit that is not of God. It means you're a wagonist. You only go to things that looks like it's getting victory. But you don't understand victory. You don't understand the cost of victory. You don't understand the cost that he's probably going through and the things he probably had in his head and the tears he wanted to cry. But you don't understand the cost of victory because it's always easy to tear down what you didn't build. So Elisha is faced with a war. And wow, somebody doesn't like him. I'm sure Elijah is like, okay, let's tell him join the line. You need to tell some people join the line. Because there are some people in my family that is first in the line who don't like me. So join the line. And some of us have really long lines. But it's okay. It is. You ought to love God. And give God your all. Amen. And Elijah is found in a situation where he is surrounded. He looks defenseless, but he's not defenseless. He looks like he's alone, but he's not alone. He looks like God is not with him, but God is definitely with him. I say this this morning because in my foundation I've come to realize that believers, we are only moved when we stand like the servant of Elijah, the one that cannot see. I realize that it's only when we don't have sight, we don't go. I realize it's only when we are short-sighted, we ask God the same question ten times. I realize it's only when we don't have sight, we are always afraid. The moment you can see... Everything around you becomes different. Your prayer becomes different. Your language becomes different. Your action becomes different. And even your submission becomes different. So even though the enemy was all around, his servant comes out and says, Master, what are we going to do? Because the enemy has surrounded us. 
What do you know about God this morning, believers? Because that was an important question the servant asked. It helped his master able to diagnose him, to treat him. What do you know about God this morning? Do you know he's the same today and forevermore? Do you know that he is still undefeated? Do you know that because of his stripes you are already healed? Or did somebody tell you that you are still sick? Do you know that there is no weapon that can be formed against you that can prosper? Do you know that the mention of his name, every evil thing will flee? Do you know that he has never lost the war? Do you know that he is still on the throne? Do you know that he commands angels at his right and angels at his left on your behalf? Do you know that? Well, I won't take it for granted this morning, so I plan to educate you on it. Out of the 37 miracles Jesus ever did, out of the 37 miracles Jesus ever did, he restored sight six times. Someone will ask the question, why did Jesus have to repeat one miracle over and over and over? Out of all the miracles Jesus has ever done, this is the only miracle Jesus keeps repeating. He repeats it for a matter of fact six times more than all the other miracles. So I began to study. And I asked God, what is the problem with my sight? What's the problem with your sight? Why it is sight is so important to God that he gave me two eyes and one mouth. And I got to realize that medical research has found that the way we see is the way we think. Now I'm going to just let that one drop. Oh, let me go back to it now. Medical research has found that we do not only see with our eyes, but we see with our brains. So spiritually, my sight affects my brain. My sight affects my thinking. My sight affects my confession. My sight affects my belief system. My sight will affect my obedience. We're going to put the measuring stick in just in a minute, not yet. So my brain affects my sight. A lot of believers today, we are struggling with what? We know because we're struggling with what we see. And because nobody is attending to your sight, you continue to go on thinking that you're all right. You continue to go on thinking the way you talk to people is acceptable. And the things you think about people is okay. And you can talk nasty things and as long as you confess it's alright. But I've come to realize that it's because of your sight. You are limited. I also realized through the study that sight health is one of the most important health related to the brain. Many eye diseases are first brain diseases. Now you're going to have to listen up when I break this down for you. So I'm giving you the facts first. Many times you see people with eye diseases but it is a sign of a brain disease. <laughs> Spiritually, a lot of believers are deficient in sight with seeing and walking by faith because it is not a sight disease, it's a brain disease. They are messed up in their mind. They are deformed in their thinking. Their mind has been so suppressed by 
demons that their sight cannot manifest what God is showing them. And you ask yourself, why is my husband thinking like this? Why is my wife always going back to her past? Why is she always bringing up stuff from Egypt and throwing in my face? Because the problem is not what you did now. The problem is where her mind is. Her mind continues to affect her sight. I also came to realize from the study that a lot of brain deficiency can be linked to sight disease. Because you don't see clearly, the brain grows abnormal. Because you cannot figure out what you're really seeing, the brain tells you that's all there is. But the man who can see is going to tell you there is more than what you are seeing. If you could only see, your mind will comprehend that there is more for you than them that which is against you. But the problem is not so much the religion. The problem is not so much the church. The problem is not so much the transition. The problem is the sight. You are short-sighted. You can't help to interpret more than what you have seen. So I'm teaching a little bit this morning first. So what happens, it causes the brain to be underdeveloped. So if you meet someone who was blind and they regain sight, the first sight of sight is going to be like a baby seeing sight for the first time. And their brain is now going to literally start up recollecting data that this is what a tree really looks like and not what they have been told the image is. When God said faith is the substance of things not seen. What God was literally telling the church is faith is what the natural brain cannot comprehend. But if the spiritual eyes can see it, then you can believe it. Some of us, we're still trying to see God in our carnal mind. We're still trying to comprehend God with the way we think. He said, my ways are higher than your ways. You can't comprehend God the way you think. You can't love God the way you love people because you're always going to fall short. God said, I need your sight to be restored. I need your eyes to be open because a lot of us came this morning here. We walked to this place. We put on our clothes. We got in the mirror. We threw on some eyelashes and we got to this place, but we ain't seen yet. We haven't opened our eyes yet. We have walked carnally, but we have not arrived spiritually. Our eyes are still closed. Our eyes are still filled with yampi. We ain't seen yet. We ain't know yet. We're going to leave this place, some of us, still blind. 